Today, on Commitment to Truth. As Christians, we cannot submit to the temptation of this world, whatever that temptation may be. When your friends are joking with some funny jokes or talking bad about a boss or talking bad about another employee, we don't partake in those things. Because why? Because now we are being tempted to share what's in our hearts. And if what's in our heart is not of God and it's something negative about that person, guess what? We are not living for God. We are not being heroes for the Lord. We're not being like Joseph, men of integrity, women of integrity that stand firm in the gospel, that stand firm in the word of God, that stand firm in doing the will of God in everything that we do. Welcome to Commitment to Truth, the teaching ministry of Commitment Church, a place for all nations. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Each week, Pastor Cedric Brown and the pastoral team at Commitment Church strive to draw you into a deeper relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This week, we continue our sermon series called Heroes. We'll learn from the biblical heroes of the past found in Hebrews 11 and by faith to encourage you to become today's heroes of the faith. Here's Pastor Jose Torres, teaching pastor at Commitment Church with today's message. So we've been uh, speaking on the heroes of faith, uh, which are found, found in Hebrews 11. And today we're going to introduce you to the next hero of faith, which is found in Hebrews 11.22. If you could turn your Bibles there, and I'll introduce you to our next hero of faith. Hebrews 11.22 says this, By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave order concerning his bones. So today we have the great privilege of learning about Joseph, the son of Jacob, the son of Rachel. Who is Joseph? Again, he is the 11th son of Jacob. He is the 11th son of Jacob. He was given to Rachel, a woman that could not bear children until God opened up her womb. If you go to Genesis chapter 30, Verses 22 to 24 says this. Then God remembered Rachel and gave heed to her and opened her womb. So he conceived and she conceived and bore a son. And she said, God has taken away my reproach. His name is Joseph, saying, may the Lord give me another son. And Hebrew and Genesis 36, if we go there, uh, you can read it at a later time. You can see that Jacob was his father who had 12 sons. And Rachel did get that second son that she asked God for. She had Joseph and Benjamin. And it also mentions the other 10 sons that were uh, given to Jacob through the other women that were part of his life. In Genesis 37, 3, it says this. Now Israel, who is Jacob, his name changed when he um, was battling the angel of God. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his age and he made him a very colored token. Token. We also see that Joseph was a dreamer. He was not only a dreamer, but he also interpreted dreams. The dreams that God gave him um, caused him very much havoc. We'll get into that in a few minutes. But he was a dreamer, one who had visions of God using him in a mighty way. So today, as we proceed to talk about heroes, we have to understand what a hero is. A hero is a person that in the midst of things, in the midst of things, they are willing to run into whatever is confronting them. In the midst of things, they will go in not looking to see if it's going to cause them harm, but they're looking out for other people. 
police officers, firefighters, paramedics. Those are people that have that characteristic in their lives. Not saying that they're not scared because, trust me, when I was a law enforcement officer, I used to get scared. When the shooting started, I found some energy in me, not thinking of myself, but thinking of others, and I ran towards that fire while others were running away, just like firefighters run into a burning building trying to rescue people. They're always thinking about someone else. Well, Joseph was that type of individual. He thought about others, not himself. He gave his life to God, dedicated his life to God. So today, we're going to be talking about three points. The first point is adversity. Second point is Serving. The third point is forgiveness. What is adversity? A state or instant of serious or continual difficulties or misfortune. Continual. That means it continues. So how many of you have gone through adversity? Not no one here, right? No one's gone through adversity. I, I know you guys are good. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've gone through adversity after adversity after adversity. Things just come at me, and sometimes I cry to God and say, God, why are you letting me go through this? Do I deserve this? I question God. But God allows those things to happen to me because he wants to be glorified in me. He wants to glorify himself to this world as using me as an example for my family and my friends. Adversities. What, where do adversity occur? So in Genesis 37, from verse 3 to 36, we're not going to read them all, but we're going to hit on some key adversity that Joseph went through just because he was Joseph. Genesis 37, 4 says this, And his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so he, they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. First adversity in the family, when people in our family look at us, how God favors us, and they're not having that same favor because they're not in the will of God, sometimes they talk about us. Sometimes they hate us, a word that is real strong. My wife, when we first got together, I used to use that word a lot. I hate this. I hate that. And she would always tell me, hate is a very strong word. You might dislike something, but you don't hate it. Truly, think about what you're saying. And I've learned to not use that word as much because to hate something, there has to be a bitterness inside your heart. Something deep, deep, deep rooted in your heart that destroys you from the inside. But we see that his brothers hated him. Why? Because they were, they, they were looking at what his father was doing for him. At favoritism. Oh, he, he gave him this this robe, this this tourniquet that 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 was uh, of color stood out. It was for royalty. Well, he was special. You ever get that? If you got siblings, he's more special than me. Mom likes him more than me. Dad likes him more than me. He treats them different than me. Why do I always got to do all the chores and he doesn't have to? That jealousy falls in. It says that. In verse 8, same chapter, then his brother said to him, are you actually going to reign over us or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. God gave him a dream that and he was in a field and that he stood up and his brothers bowed down to him. He's a, he was the number 11 out of 12. So he was a younger brother. So the brothers, the older brother's like, how dare you say that we're going to bow down to you? Are you crazy? They started to hate him even more. There was that bitterness kept growing and growing in their hearts. 
Why? In verse 11, we find the secret why. Because it says this, his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the same in his mind. Another dream he had about the moons and the, the stars and bowing down again towards him. And even his father questioned it in his mind. He says, am I to bow down to my own son? It's like, but he didn't say anything. But the brothers just grew more jealous, more hatred started just flustering in their hearts and growing in their hearts. So that's what happens when there's hatred. If you allow hatred to come into your heart, that word that you shouldn't be using because it's so bitter and so strong, it grows and grows and grows to a point where you're capable of doing the craziest things to a loved one, talking bad about them, despising them, not wanting to be around them, not talking to them. Uh, I haven't talked to my brother in 20 years because, you know, he did me wrong 20 years ago, and I still hold that against him. Oh, let it go. Let it go because it's going to destroy you and your family. God does not want that for your life. He wants to be the center of your life. And if he's the center of your life, then love, mercy, and forgiveness accompany it. Verse 18 of the same chapter says this, And when they saw him from a distance, and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. The bitterness and the hatred, the jealousy that was growing within the brothers was so great that they were even willing to kill their own brother. Have you gone through that? Maybe they don't want to kill you physically, but spiritually, do they want to tear you down? Has your family turned away the word of God when you shared it to them? They don't want to hear your words because it's the word of God. The things that you're sharing to them is something that's going to give them life. Have they turned away from it because they were in sin? They have allowed sin to grow so deep in their heart that they don't want to hear God. They don't want to hear his voice through you. And they hate you for it. They don't want to know about it. They want you to die spiritually so that you no longer can bring that light into their darkness. Because when you bring light into their darkness, it opens and exposes all the wrong things that they're doing, and they feel bad. Reuben, the oldest brother, firstborn of Jacob, did not want to really kill his brother. So he allowed them to put him in the pit. And in his mind, he was going to come back and rescue him and return him back to his father before his brothers could do him harm. So Reuben left the other nine, and the other nines were still sitting around. And one of them said, listen, let's not kill our brother because that blood will be on our hands. Let us turn him over into slavery. For look who's coming. The Mennonites are coming. It says in verse 28, and some Mennonites traders passed by, so they pulled him out up. And lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 singles of silver. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. So they sold him into slavery instead of killing him. Just as bad. Another adversity that this young man, he's a teenager, he had to endure. Now he's a slave. Something that he'd lost his freedom he was in his father's household. He was loved greatly by his father, was well taken care of by his father. And now he was going to become a slave to these Ismaelites. And they took him to Egypt. So adversity comes in different forms and ways. People hate you. People are jealous of you. People want to kill you. People want to sell you into slavery. What slavery? Into the enemy's slavery. So that you can also be in sin. If they sell you into slavery or encourage you to go into the wrong things, then now you become a slave of the enemy. 
and they could destroy you. That's adversity that we face today, every day, that people don't want to accept God, and they look at us as the light of God, and they don't want nothing to do with us, although we have done any, nothing wrong. But adversity doesn't stop in the family, but also in the workplace. Adversity in the workplace. Have you ever had adversity in your workplace where you're working hard and someone tries to get you to do something that you know is wrong? Hey, today we're going to take an extra hour of lunch. The boss not around, so it ain't going to matter. We'll clock in early and take that extra hour of lunch. Ain't nothing wrong with that. It's only an hour of lunch. We ain't stealing much, but it's still sin. And if you fall into that temptation in that trap and you accompany them in what they're doing, then you're not doing the will of God and you're not going to be a good example for they want you to go through that adversity with them. Genesis 39, verse 10 to 19, we find Joseph in a peculiar place. Potiphar's house. God had blessed him and gave him favor with Potiphar and brought him inside the house from the fields. And now he was given the privilege to be the, the head servant in the house. He was given responsibility because the favor of God was with him. Potiphar saw that, that this young man was being blessed. Everything he touched was being blessed. Everything was being fruitful. Everything he did was fruitful. Amen. And now he brings them in and puts them in charge of his household. Remember, Joseph was in his teens, young man, probably very strong from all the work that he did, well built, probably a good looking guy, you know? And Potiphar's wife started looking at him in a different way. It says that in verse 10, as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. Nor it happened one day, now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was, were in there. How convenient. She caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. And when she saw that he had left the garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called to the men of the household and said to them, See, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I screamed. When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he, fled his, he, he, he left his garments beside me and fled and went outside. So she left his garments beside her until his master came home. And then she spoke to him with these words. The Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came into me to make sport of me. And as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. She plotted against Joseph. She created an atmosphere where she wanted him to do something with her that was wrong in the sight of God. She wanted him to lay down with her because she felt that he was attractive, that he would be tempted to be with the master's wife. But she did not see Joseph's heart, a man of integrity, a man full of the will of God, wanting to serve his Lord with all he had. And he did not submit to that temptation. How are we like Joseph? As Christians, we cannot submit to temptation of this world, whatever that temptation may be. 
be it when your friends are joking with some funny jokes, but including sexual innuendos or talking bad about a boss or talking bad about another employee. We don't partake in those things because why? Because now we are being tempted to share what's in our hearts. And if what's in our heart is not of God and is something negative about that person, guess what? We are not living for God. We are not being heroes for the Lord. We're not being like Joseph, men of integrity, women of integrity that stand firm in the gospel, that stand firm in the word of God, that stand firm in doing the will of God in everything that we do. Thank you for joining us for today's message from Commitment to Truth. We'll continue with the second part of the message right after this. Hello, my name is Norberto Colon Jr. and I'm a ministry leader for the worship ministry at Commitment Church, a place for all nations. I would like to personally invite you to come to one of our events this month. For the latest events, you can visit commitmentchurch.org slash events. And if you and your family are looking for a church, we're here on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Thank you again for joining us for today's message from Commitment to Truth. We now return for the second half of our message. This brings us to our second point. Joseph served like doing unto God. What does that mean? He served like doing unto God. That when he served his masters, his bosses, he served them like he was doing it to God. Not for the masters, but for God. Everything he did was for God. And that's why God's favor fell upon him. That everything that he touched, everything that he did was fruitful. In Genesis 39, verses 1 to, to 5, we, we can read those verses, and it says that Joseph found favor in um, Potiphar's eyes because everything he touched was being blessed. Everything he did was being blessed, and they was blessing Potiphar's house. That's why he made him the overseer in the household. But after Potiphar's wife accused him of wrongdoing, that was not true, an allegation that was not true. Joseph still stood firm in the word of God and in God, and he trusted God through that affliction. And he served his God when he was placed in the prison. Well, now he's in the prison. The chief jailer starts to notice something. Genesis 39, verses 20 to 23 says this. So Joseph... So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in jail. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sights of the chief jailer. And the chief jailers committed to Joseph's charge of all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there he was responsible for. In your workplace, does your boss see you through his eyes? Is God revealing to him that you are a man of integrity, a man of your word, a woman of your word, a woman of integrity, that you stand firm in the Lord and that you do all things not in servitude of your boss, but in servitude of God, to represent God in your workplace. I use my wife as an example. She works for Walmart. She is a HR uh, representative there. And everything that she does, she does for the Lord, not for her bosses. There came, there's coming up an event, Pride week. Something that she really doesn't really, really believe in. But being an HR, she has to be neutral. She has to uh, support all the people. But in her belief, she says, babe, if they fire me, be ready because I'm standing on God. 
I believe that God has instructed me not to partake of that. And I'm not going to partake. And if they want to fire me, they can fire me. But I'm standing firm in what I believe. I don't judge people for who they are and what they do. But I'm standing firm in my beliefs. And because she stands firm in her belief and she's doing it for God, guess what? She don't have to partake. Because others that are not believers say, I agree with you. I don't believe in it. <laughs> you shouldn't be forced to serve them or take part in that activity because you truly don't believe in it. And we understand why. So God took care of that for her because God saw that she was serving him and not the bosses and even willing to sacrifice her job and say, I can start over somewhere else. So when you are serving God to the fullest of your capacity and bringing honor and glory to him first and foremost. What happens to your bosses and your employers because of you standing in their employment, their employment now flourishes. Their businesses start to flourish because you are standing there. Because you are a believer of God and a servant of God and serve God. But it didn't stop there because Joseph interpreted some dreams for the, the, the cupbearer and the baker. And unfortunately for one, the, the two dreams were fulfilled. One died and one was placed back into the, the palace. And then we find Pharaoh in Genesis 41. He's having these dreams, reoccurring dreams, and he's asking all his wise men and all the, all the magicians to interpret for him, and, and no one can interpret the dream. But the cupbearer remembered what Joseph told him and in his interpretation of his dream and how it came true. The cupbearer said, listen, Pharaoh, there's a young Hebrew that's in the jail, and he interpreted mine's and the baker's dream, and the dream came true. Maybe you should seek him, and maybe his God can interpret your dream. So Pharaoh calls for Joseph to come. Joseph interprets the dream of, of the seven years of famine and the preparation for, for the famine. And Pharaoh saw that he was wise and that his words were, were guided by God. And Pharaoh said this. Then Pharaoh said to his servant, can we find a man like this in whom is a divine spirit? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and according to your commands, all the people shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all of Egypt. So when you're doing the will of God, when you are working for God and seeking God, God places you in unique places. He puts you in authority. He gives you the privilege to lead others. The boss might tell you, Hey, you're my guy, or you're my gal. I trust you. I got to go on vacation. You're in charge. I know everything's going to be okay. Take care of business for me, because I know your God is going to support you. And God, your God is going to bless this company and this business. So serving God with all you got brings blessings to you and others. The last point before closing, Joseph forgave. Ooh, that's a scary word, forgiveness. <laughs> to forgive, to let go, to cease, to feel uh, resentment against an offender. Easier said than done sometimes, right? You've been offended. You've been 
talked down to, mistreated? Have you quickly forgiven them? Or you, have you hold, held that grudge inside your heart? I'm not saying anything to that person until they tell me to forgive them because I'm not going to forgive them because they did me wrong. <laughs> Good thing God sent his son, Jesus Christ, and he didn't think that way because we would be in a terrible place because he forgave us for our sins. And he's always there to forgive us for our wrongdoings. All we have to do is call on his name and just ask him for forgiveness. Why can't we be the same as our Lord Jesus Christ? Joseph was in chapter 45. It's a long chapter, but it tells the story of the time of the famine, how Jacob sent his sons to go get food, and they went back and forth. Joseph saw them immediately and un understood that they were his brothers, but his brothers did not recognize him. Joseph could have quickly remember what they did to him and they were trying to kill him and all the plots that they did, they, hate, they hated him and they were jealous of him. Could have remembered that and now he's second in command of Egypt and he could have said, oh, here we go. Now you're going to, you're going to pay for this. Take my brothers, put them in the jail. Take my brothers, put them in the lion's den. Take my brothers and put the spear to them, hang them, whatever. He had that authority to do it, and the Egyptian army would have done it. Because Pharaoh said, whatever he says, you do. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible said he wept. He left their presence, and he wept because he was rejoiced to see his brothers still alive. And he did not remember their transgressions against him. And it says by the end, when he asked for his father to come and bring his brother Benjamin and, and, and bring the whole entire family over, he reveals himself to his brother, and the brothers were scared. <laughs> like, oh, that's Joseph. And what did they do? You recall? They bowed down to him. The entire family bowed down to him. So your adversities in your life may lead to something great that God wants to do at the end where you're going to be blessed. Others may be saved. Others may be blessed because of your obedience to God, being diligent to God, and doing what God instructed you to do in a humble way and having a forgiving heart. Colossians 3, 12 and 13 says this. So as... Those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also shall, should you forgive. So when someone causes you grief, causes you to think that, oh, they did me wrong, remember, what would Jesus do? And if you're living for God, for Jesus Christ, you will share the love and mercy that he's shared with you. For what is the greatest thing that we can give is our love for one another. No matter who is the person that offends me. I try to live my life this way. I might be offended by something you say or do, but I don't let it go to my heart. Because if I let it go to my heart, then it'll just grow, grow, grow with hatred, jealousy, enviness, wanting to do wrong to that person. Just like his brothers, they, they allow that hatred, that jealousy, that, that sin life to grow to a point where they wanted to kill him. 
And he repaid them with love, mercy, and God's grace over them. So if you don't know Jesus Christ, you probably don't know how to live like a hero. Joseph was a hero, a son of a hero, serving the heroes of heroes, Jesus Christ. So today, if you're going through some adversities and you don't understand why God is allowing you to go through that adversity, do not submit to the adversity, but overcome those adversities through Jesus Christ by serving him with all you got, giving him all that you have, all the energy you have until the moment that you meet him, be it through the trumpet or through his calling to, you, to his presence. And forgive others as God has forgiven you. Because if you forgive others as God has forgiven you, what it happens to that person is they feel the burden of forgiveness over them. And it may change their heart. And they may see God in you and may see Jesus in you. And they may want to be like you. If you know this God, be the hero. If you don't know this God, today's the opportunity to experience him. Hello, this is Cedric Brown, your teacher on Commitment to Truth. I would like to personally thank you so much for tuning in week after week to listen here on this station. My prayer is that our time together is encouraging and strengthening you in your personal walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, I'm not going to assume that all of you know this Christ that I speak about week after week. And if you don't, and this is you, my prayer is that you are being inspired to know him personally through commitment to truth. But if you want to invite this Christ into your life right now, would you like to please pray with me? It's just a short prayer. It goes like this. Just say, Jesus, I acknowledge today that I am a sinner and I've sinned against you. But I believe that you came to die for me. You were buried for me and you rose again from the grave just for me. Jesus, I ask you to come into my life to be my Lord and my risen Savior. And I surrender my life completely to you until I see you face to face. Jesus, would you, would you please empower me through your Holy Spirit to live the rest of my life for your glory and for the good of others? In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. So if you pray this prayer, or if you need help finding a local Christ-centered and Bible teaching church, please email me at info at commitment to truth dot org. Once again, that is info at commitment to truth dot org. And lastly today, could you please do two things for me, all of you? Number one, could you spread the word about commitment to truth to your friends, your family, and even your enemies? We all could learn, right? And secondly, please email me at info at commitment to truth to let me know how this ministry is impacting your life. Once again, that is info at commitmenttotruth.org. I would love to hear from you. May God bless you and your family and have a great day. Thank you again for listening to our series From Commitment to Truth, the teaching ministry of Commitment Church, a place for all nations. If you want to listen to the previous messages in this series, or if you want to hear messages from other series, visit Commitment Church on YouTube or Pastor Cedric Brown on Spotify, Pandora, or other podcast providers. You can also visit us on our website, commitmentchurch.org. And if you live in the Philadelphia, Delaware, or South Jersey area, we would love to see you in person as well. You can attend any of our services by visiting us at 2 Berlin Road South, Lindenwald, New Jersey, 08021. Thank you again for listening and have a blessed and wonderful day.